So, Anu, hello and welcome to today's episode of Lix University Talks. And first and foremost, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your career and about your professional profile. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much. And my name is Anu Ratninde, and I grew up in uh, central part of Sri Lanka. And after my degree in electrical and electronic engineering, I started to uh, my, my industrial career in Singapore and uh, started working in electronics product design. And then soon I realized that electronics engineering is not enough, that need to have mechanical engineering to combine, to design the housing sensors and actuators. So, so I had the knowledge gap. So I went and studied a master's degree in mechatronics uh, from National University of Singapore, and then start working in the industry. And I was uh, finally came to uh, as the uh, Asia Pacific uh, business development and innovation manager at, at, at that stage. And then the company that I worked for at that time moved me to US uh, and become a general manager of a global business. And then I realized that I have a gain knowledge gap. So I had to do an MBA to start how things get connected from, from finance to the economics, to operations, supply chain. So, so I did an MBA from Indiana University Kelly School of Business. And then I also did a master's in global management from uh, Thunderbird University because things are global. I need to be successful in, in globally. And, and I was doing uh, managing very large businesses, uh, global businesses, uh, from uh, starting from 10,000 people reporting to me, and I was, I was uh, 30,000 people under me uh, around the world. So it's a large, complex businesses. And, and then I also lived in uh, Hong Kong, and, and then I was uh, living in Switzerland. And uh, while I was in Switzerland and a president of a business, I was very curious that why some leaders are uh, successful and some leaders fail. So I was very curious around it. And, and at that time, I had three master's degrees and everyone is like, are you crazy? But I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in, in learning. Every time I see an opportunity, that's what I learn. It's not just to get a degree per se. So it's, it's learning. So with that curiosity about why leaders are successful and why some fail, I was very curious. I was doing interesting in research around it. That's when I connected with Leeds University and, and I expressed my interest on this subject. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and Lix University was very kind and cooperative with me. And that's when I started my PhD and I got that uh, completed with the Lix University. <laughs> How did you find Lix University in the first place? Well, I think I, I found it through one of my colleagues who had studied uh, there as well and was recommended on the, on the flexibility and, and as well as the ability to customized into the needs and flexibility. I think that was, that was very much required at that time for me. Definitely. And that's how I started connecting with Leeds. Okay, so you have graduated in 2019. What do you remember the most about your studies at Leeds University? I think what I was remember the most, uh, to me, uh, I mean, at that time, I, I was already a president of a global business and I had three master's degrees. And, and if you look at it at that time, I was not looking for uh, academic foundation at mm -hmm. that time. I was, I was really looking for answering my question. My, I'm, I'm curious about this leadership and, and a connecting. I think I, I remember very well about initial phase of connecting and understanding my needs and connecting to the process of answering my needs to, to, to find out a very practical approach to my research and also connecting with the right supervisors for the academic foundation. To me, I, I remember that very well. And I think the other thing I remember very well is, is how punctual it was. It was like every time I asked a question, I helped me to, that was like, like really quick and fast and uh, was able to get to the depth uh, I, I needed in study. If you could go back in time and had to make the decision to enroll, would you? I wouldn't change a thing. I will, I'll, I'll go back to Leeds. <laughs> Perfect. Glad to hear that. So what would you highlight the most about your studies at Leeds? You know, I, because I'm curious about leadership, so I studied uh, leadership uh, way back 2,500 years ago from, from Buddha and from Lao Tzu and Kansa and Machiavelli and Frederick Tail and, and then starting behavioral leadership, transactional leadership to transformation service. I mean, be, be any kind of leadership theory out there, I think I, I probably went and studied. And I'm still curious. I'm, I was not looking for the answer that I'm, I'm looking for. So I, I was very curious, I think, how to lead in this knowledge era, because I think Fundamentally, maybe part of Frederick Taylor's start on leadership 
I still figure out that it's all is about there is leader and everyone is a follower. So until up mm-hmm. until I get connected with the complexity leadership, that leadership is can be organizations can be complex adaptive systems where people interact interdependent and they learn and adapt and continuously evolve is basically a living system and it's not a machine so <laughs> taking organizations as living systems with the complexity leadership i think i found the answer i was looking for at that that time complexity leadership theory is basically a theoretical framework so my study uh, my focus was to get, make it give it a practical approach mm-hmm. that leaders can can apply it so I was able to develop a five step approach in a shifting leadership from uh, industrial age to knowledge era holding the leader accountable so that it doesn't become someone else's fault but but how the leader is accountable to transform to get things done in in, in knowledge era and and that was my study about mm-hmm. That sounds really interesting and it seems like it actually paved your way through your career. So I would like to mention that uh, your speeches you are often giving the speeches. So your speeches often mention the complexity leadership, the importance of global leadership, international business, cross-cultural communication. So why do you find these topics important in particular? I, I think if you look at I think it's true for leadership but let's for example take the global leadership I mean everyone wants to do global business because to to grow business enter in new markets to diversify geographically and access to new talents and all these good reasons to uh, companies want to do global business but once you start the global business then you start getting the barriers uh, for doing global business starting with these cultural barriers the geopolitical risk the entry and exit cost they had to deal with so so all other the risk that is comes with that but the mm-hmm. challenge is now how do we how do we manage this thing i think there are a lot of tools around it right i mean if you look at any capital budgeting project that there's a lot of tools how you evaluate in making a lot of assumptions and and analyze data and data that's kind of the easy part of it mm-hmm. the, the easy part of it is is that, i mean how do you do a complex capital budgeting process analyze it interpret the data to to me that that's kind of the easy process but the hard part is really doing it on the soft skill side of it but if you look at like big companies like general motors General Motors lost 20 billion dollars in Europe in 17 years mm-hmm. and finally they decided to exit Europe. I mean it's not because Europe is a bad uh, market for automotive business mm-hmm. that's that's a, that's a great market but that's the difficulties of doing business in Europe for General Motors so they had to exit after spending a lot of money there. Mm-hmm. So that is the soft side of it. I mean it's important to do global business it's important to do international business cross cultural communications and complexity leadership. So it's not about that hard skill side of it it's about that soft skill side of it and mm-hmm. i've been successful around the world 25 years managing large business across the world and i believe i have gained that experience that is required not not just the hard skills and also the soft skills and i find there is a need for it and i think every time when i when i speak to someone when i share my personal experiences and when i share what is necessary to be successful i find that uh, very good uh, acceptance from the audience so, so i i think that's something that i could contribute to society more and like gives me more encouragement to continue on that path awesome that leads me to my next question which is what is a good leadership and i think you've partly answered this question and why does a company need a good leader I think if you look at like uh, the first part of the question what is a good leader I think that we we have to accept that the leader has to get things done mm-hmm. I mean the organizations have organizational goals I mean whether it is growing business and delivering on financial commitments turn around making the operations better whatever the task may be the organization has to achieve organizational goals but that's just the half the equation And the other half of the equation is the people in the organization are they achieving their own goals. Yeah. So if I'm the organization I think we can talk about our financial matrix looking good and a business is is double and margins are improving that's all great stuff but if the individuals aren't achieving their own goals it's it's only half of the business. I I think that that's the good leader will make sure the both will be achieved. The organization will have its own goals. as well as the people will have achieve their own goals i think to to go to the second part of your question why does a company need a goal i think i think if somebody calls me and say hey i know there is a leadership job 
I know there is a job to be done. Company doesn't hire me to develop people mm -hmm. oftentimes. Company doesn't hire me to help contribute to society because oftentimes when they we hire a leader, typically either some leader retiring and want to upgrade the next leadership, or maybe previous leader didn't work well and they're replacing. Typically, there's a big job to be done. Grow business, improve profitability, fix broken business, expand globally, do a brand new product innovation, mm -hmm. some challenges in it. And, yeah. and we got to do it. I think that the leader should be able to do it. But I don't think that's the, that's the problem. Oh, I don't think that's the question that leader has to deal with. I think the real question is how, mm -hmm. how leader does it, how? right? I mean, how leader does it? I think that's the part that is going to get into. So I'm a strong believer that nobody comes to work. Nobody comes to work, do anything bad to the company. Mm -hmm. Everybody come to work do something good and contribute. Definitely. If they're not contributing, either because we tie their hands with a lot of processes and procedures and we just tell them you're not capable and uh, so they, they just limit themselves. I, oh, I think we're not motivating enough to do more. I think to me about unleashing that potential, unleashing that potential that everyone has potential to contribute to the company. So if you unleash that potential, great things will happen. Mm -hmm. Great things will happen. And not only for the company, and it's also for, for, for people themselves. Sometimes people don't know how capable and how talented they are. It's important we, we sometimes we test them. We help them test themselves, put them on a stretch assignment and see whether they're successful or not. To me, a company needs a good leader to deliver on the commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very, very important. But at the same time, it's important to make sure the people achieve their goals and, and to do in a way that we're not damaging the environment and we're contributing to society, that it is sustainable. It's not that we're trying to deliver performance one month, one quarter, one year. Mm -hmm. We're trying to build something that is sustainable, that is going to last for a long time so that leaders can continue to deliver time and time again. Yeah. I think that's the hardest part. So you have said that the greatest question of them all is how it is done. I would like to mention that uh, you are currently working on your new book that is going to be published in 2022. Can you foreshadow what are the main themes and topics in the book? What is the book going to be about? Thank you for asking that. I think if you look at, you know, I mean, if you, if you go a little bit back to like industrial revolution time and before the industrial revolution, People start, people were working in the farms and with the, when the factories started, people come to the plants, uh, manufacturing plants to work factories. And then in these factories, basically it's the owner operator running and now need to manage people. They were looking for ways to manage it. That's when exactly uh, in 1911, Frederick Taylor wrote a book called Scientific, uh, The Principles of Scientific Management. It's 111 years old. And in that book, basically he said, the organizations are machines by pulling the right levers, you can get a certain mm -hmm. outcome. I mean, it's unfortunately, after more than 100 years later, some leaders still do believe that organizations are machines and you can mm -hmm. just tweak one or two variables and get things done. I mean, what Frederick Taylor did is actually he applied the, the Newton's laws of motion into the organization. The Newton's laws of motion is for, is for how objects move. And I think that applying to organizations as machines were, was okay where in the industrial age when you really wanted was labor. Mm -hmm. But today, organizations need knowledge people. People, we have to use the employees' knowledge. And not only that, people are very, by themselves, knowledgeable with a lot of information sharing that's going on. People are very knowledgeable. So you can't really take advantage of the organization. So, and we have to use their knowledge to be successful. So how do we use that? I mean, quite frankly, the Newton's laws were actually proven wrong. In the sense, at least, they were shown that the principle of strong causation that said that whatever works in one place will work in another place. That has been replaced with the principle of weak causation that said, no, it doesn't mean if one thing works in one place will work in another place, mm -hmm. but on average, it will work. Mm -hmm. I think this whole concept of average and statistical paradigm is kind of like confusing leaders, I think, <laughs> because 
It's dangerous to apply principles that work on average. It is very dangerous to put principles that work on average. I think if you look at 20, 30 years ago, uh, when you hire somebody, uh, and that's a lifetime employment. When you join a company, it is a lifetime employment. Maybe in some cases, maybe even marriages at that time were lifetime. But, but people decisions are no longer lifetime. They're not certain. Decisions we take are very uncertain. We cannot just take decisions be because they were statistically significant, because on average it works. So we had to make sure that we had to accept the fact it is uncertain. Instead of accepting it's uncertain, using the theories that works on average, that is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think my book is going to be about, you accept that it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. When you hire somebody, to a leadership job. When the board hires a CEO, it is uncertain that he's going to take the company forward or company backward. If you take <laughs> wrong decisions in three years, maybe you will be taking a company worse. You don't know that, right? And even when you take a job in a company, uh, you're not sure whether you're gonna be successful or, or not. So I think we accept when we take these decisions uncertain, and then how do we change our behavior how do you do that? I think that's what I'm going to talk about in the complexity paradigm. How do we, how, as leaders, continue to deliver time and time again? We know that organizations are not machines. Customers and suppliers and markets are not machines. Employees are not machines. We know the outcome is uncertain, right? It's definitely uncertain when you make an investment decision, when you hire somebody. We know that those decisions are uncertain. So if, if you know that decisions are uncertain, what do leaders need to do to still get things done? I think that's what it is. I'm going to give a very simple five steps. It is based on the complexity theory. That's complex adaptive systems, ladder system theory, but I'm not going to talk any of those things in the book. It is going to be a very simple book without even knowing the complexity theories uh, for practical purpose. Very simple five steps. How would leaders get things done in knowledge era when the outcome is uncertain? All right, that, that sounds like a really interesting point of view and the problem. So where can we get the book once published? I'm sure it's going to be available online as well as on major bookstores. And, uh, and I, I hope that you will find it valuable and it's going to be, give you great insights on how you can uh, manage uh, and get things done in knowledge era when the outcome is uncertain. Okay, perfect. So, Anu, thank you for meeting me today. It was really nice talking to you today. And good luck with your book and good luck with writing and publishing. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.